So today, we are continuing our sermon series in the book of Acts. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9. Uh, and so I want to encourage you to grab your Bible if you brought it today or grab one from the seat in front of you. And uh, feel free to turn to Acts chapter 9. If you're using one of our two Bibles, you can find it on page 1100. So it's like what, a, what an oddly symmetrical number there. Um, so feel free to turn to page 1100 and we'll continue on. Now, today, uh, we're going to be hearing about a very significant event in the life of the early church, and that is the conversion of Paul. Many of you guys may have heard about this, and I hope that as we discuss it today, it'll bring some new life to it. Um, I want to, before we dive into the message itself, I want to briefly show you a map here, because we're hearing about a bunch of different places. And if you're like me, you might sometimes scratch your head when you hear about all these, these areas and wonder what we're talking about. So just to give you a notion here, um, Jerusalem's here. This is the Mediterranean Sea. If we were to zoom out a long ways, there'd be Egypt over here and, and uh, Greece and Rome uh, up on the other edges of the Mediterranean. But here's Jerusalem. And what we're going to hear about is uh, Saul making a trip up to Damascus today. And so Damascus is actually outside of Judea, and it's, it's in modern-day Syria. And so uh, there, he's going to be making a journey to this major city uh, in order to, to go persecute believers, and uh, which is his intention. We'll also hear that he travels at some point to Arabia. I want to point out that this is down way south of Israel. Um, and finally, we're also going to hear a bit about the travels of Peter right at the end. And that's just to give you some notion. It's not the cities aren't actually marked on the map, but they're going to be over here to the far west of the Dead Sea, right off the Mediterranean coast. And so that's sort of the, the area he's headed to. Um, as we talk about this today, just as a reminder, our, our message series in the book of Acts uh, is, is talking about how we need to act as a church, what we need to do to be the church and to live out things appropriately. Rich, would you jump to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so as we talk about that, last week we, we concluded hearing about Philip and his interactions, uh, really his ministry. And it concluded with, his, with him encountering the Ethiopian eunuch and winning him to the Lord. And we heard about Peter coming and sharing God's word with people throughout Samaria as they had heard the gospel. And uh, so today, we're going to focus primarily on the conversion of, of Saul, who later will be called Paul. But I'll warn you, at the end of our passage, we're going to have uh, two sections of scripture that we read that are about the life of Peter. And those will be really relevant to next week's message. Um, we're especially going to focus on, on the first four sections of the passage we read, but the very closing paragraphs we're still going to go through and work through, but they tie in more with next week's message, so you'll just have to kind of uh, delineate those two in your mind. But I, I always want to read totally word for word what we find in Scripture. We know God's Word is powerful and, and can move in us, and so uh, I didn't want to skip over anything or mix stuff up. So with that, uh, would you guys join me? Let's take a moment to pray before we begin our, our study. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would be at work in this time. I pray that you would draw our hearts to you, and that through what we read today, we might understand who you are more clearly and who we are in you. Let's give us faith uh, to follow you, to seek after you, and to bring your will into our lives. And we love you, and we pray these things in Jesus. Okay, so uh, chapter 9, we're going to begin with verses 1 through 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you were persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city. And you will be told what to do. The men traveling the Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but not, did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, 
And when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus for three days. He was blind and did not eat or drink anything. All right. Now, in previous chapters, we've heard about Saul. Saul sort of came onto the scene when we saw the, the murder of Stephen, where a bunch of religious officials from Jerusalem uh, were angry at Stephen for undermining what they were doing. And so um, they gathered him together. They put a kangaroo court together, put him on trial, and went ahead and drug him out in the streets and stoned him to death. And when they did that, Saul was there cheering those men on. He actually held their coats, washed over their coats for him just to make sure they stayed clean, and cheered them on in that action. And so that was our first introduction to Saul. And ironically, that murder of Stephen is part of what caused the church to spread rapidly. We see at the day of Pentecost, it, it branched out from people who were visiting from, from out of the area. But after Stephen's death, Saul ramped up his persecution of the church. We'll say cranked it up to 10, so to speak. Yeah, he started going door to door, arresting any Christian person he could find. In fact, it was that very persecution that drove Philip, who we read about previously, Philip the Evangelist, to leave Jerusalem and begin evangelizing in other areas. Because he knew, boy, if I, if I go out and preach the gospel on the streets here in Jerusalem, they'll just arrest me and kill me. That doesn't sound like a very good deal. Um, and so Paul has really been at the foreground of all of this. And apparently he's, he's picked all the low-hanging fruit, so to speak. He's captured every convenient to grab Christian in Jerusalem itself, and he's not contented. He finds his heart is not contented with that. And so he goes to the chief priests in Jerusalem, probably Caiaphas, and says to him, hey, I've kind of franchised this thing out as much as I can here. I've captured and killed as many Christians as possible. I want to go somewhere else. I hear up in Damascus, a ways from here, that there's a whole bunch of them there. With your blessing, I'll go. You can write me some notes to the local churches so they know why I'm coming. And I'll arrest as many of them as I can and drag them back here. How does that sound? And, of course, the high priest signs off on that. He's all for the idea. And so Saul goes on this journey, taking a few men with him, probably men to be used to help capture and, and transport all these prisoners back once he finds them. And uh, they're along the journey headed to Damascus. Now, Damascus is about a six-day journey from Jerusalem. So it's going to take him several days uh, to actually get there and... Uh, just at the outskirts of Damascus, we see that Saul has a vision. Suddenly, he's driven to his knees, a bright light shines around him, and he hears a heavenly voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Now, of course, if you look at the passage so far, it isn't actually Jesus himself who Saul's been persecuting, it's been his followers. But it's interesting to note that in Jesus' eyes, these are equivalent things. If you persecute Christians, then what you're doing is actually against him, is effectively what Jesus is inferring here. And so Jesus asked the question of Saul, and Saul basically says, I have no idea who you are. Who are you that I've heard of you? And he says, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And Saul doesn't try to argue against this. He's, he is guilty, dead to rights. And so he, he accepts the responsibility for that. Now, simultaneously, we have these two men next to him, and we hear that they hear part of what's going on, um, but don't fully grasp it. And it maybe we see in other accounts that perhaps they see some of the light, but they don't actually see Jesus himself in this vision standing before Saul. And so they're not fully seeing what's going on, but they know something supernatural is happening at that moment. Uh, and so basically Jesus says to Saul, head back to Damascus, head up there, finish your journey, and wait. I'm going to send somebody to you. You'll know later exactly what's coming. And so uh, Saul opens his eyes at the end of the vision, Preparing to follow these orders, he discovers, oh, not only this, but I'm blind. Now, there is something metaphoric, I think, about this, because really, Saul has been very blind to who Jesus is so far. In spite of being one of the most knowledgeable men in Jerusalem, Saul, who, who trained under Gamaliel, the most respected Pharisee of Jesus' day, in spite of that, Saul's really not connecting the dots and seeing Jesus for who he is. And so it's interesting that a physical blindness is sort of uh, in a sense, a symptom of a, spiritu of a spiritual blindness that's happening here as well. So, let's see how things continue. Uh, we'll now read verses 10 through 19. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Strait Street. And ask 
asked for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he was praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he said to me, so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Okay, so as our last section left off, Saul was in a severe fast. He was, he was not, not only not eating food for three days, but he didn't even consume water for three days. And there are various kinds of fasting. What Paul's doing here is, is often termed as an extreme fast, when you give up all of those things. Um, up to three days is actually a pretty dangerous point to not have any water, because it can become deadly after that. Uh, but I guess God decided he wasn't done with him yet, so he, he came... Uh, and obviously went and had this conversation with Ananias. Now, we hear, when he talks to Ananias, Jesus says that he's already given a vision to Saul, so Saul knows what's coming up here. But he, Jesus comes in, having this vision to Ananias, says, you need to go down off of Straight Street. Now, interestingly, in Damascus, cool note, um, as archaeologists have excavated the ancient city, one of the main thoroughfares in the ancient city, running from east to west, is a street called Straight Street. So this actually would be like the main drag in town, and so, with that, we hear that there's a man named Judas who has a house there. You're supposed to go find this house, and you're going to find a guy named, named Saul of Tarsus. In the ancient world, oftentimes, uh, your last name would be the area you're from. And so, if you were born here in Myrtle Point, uh, then, then you might be Lois of Myrtle Point. I think you're actually from Coquille, right, Lois? But <laughs> you guys get the point. Um, and so, that's sort of the way that names would work, but it would help to know who people are. And so, Jesus says, there's this guy... You need to go find him. He's at that house. And so there's no location. And Ananias' response is pretty understandable. Are you crazy? I've heard about this guy. I've heard about all the stuff he's done. Lord, he's persecuted your people. He's been dragging off men and women in Jerusalem in chains and having them executed. And you want me to go visit him? In some sense, to Ananias, this might have been a little bit like being asked to go visit the boogeyman. <laughs> Here is this really scary guy, and no doubt, we can, well, we can see that he's heard lots of accounts from Jerusalem, probably people fleeing for their lives. Many of them might have been saying, you know, I, my brother and his wife, they got captured, and so I decided to flee Jerusalem, I decided to come here, and so I'm looking for a new place to settle. He's probably heard a lot of these accounts going on. We also see from these accounts that, although Ananias probably has a Jewish background, because you know, early Christians at this stage were virtually all of Jewish descendancy and, and part of of Judaism, uh, Ananias here is a local. He, he doesn't say, I used to live in Jerusalem and now I came here, but he, he says, I've heard what's happened down there from clear up here, several days travel away. Word's already gotten here. So the guy here asking me to go visit, he sounds really scary, and, and I'm not sure, Jesus, this is such a wise idea. And yet Jesus responds to him and basically says, I'll do with him what I want. I've told him you're going to go there, I've told him in a vision that you by name are going to be there, that you're going to lay hands on him, and that through that, he's going to be healed of his blindness. And so Saul is expecting all of this. To Ananias, it must be a terrifying prospect, though, because this guy's the number one persecutor. And not only that, but we actually hear from Ananias' response, he actually already knows. He's heard rumors in traveling from Jerusalem ahead of Saul that it's known Saul's coming up, that Saul's got the blessing of the chief priest to come to that area and to arrest anybody he gets a hold of. And so this is... Saul's whole purpose, and now uh, Ananias has been asked to go there. What I want to point out as we're walking through this is we're seeing a lot of people who have a certain expectation of what God is doing, and yet that expectation turns out being completely wrong. 
Saul, for example, totally believed with utter conviction that Jesus was not the Messiah. That's not possibly who he was. He believes it so firmly, he is so vehement about it, that he's going around and arresting his countrymen and having him put on trial and beaten or executed because of it. And his zeal towards that, for Saul, we can just see from his personality, this isn't something that he's doing just out of a sense of general obligation. He believes this is a spiritually right thing to do. And so he is going now up to Damascus because he's captured as many Christians as he can. And on the way, suddenly he starts to realize what I thought God was doing wasn't quite right. I thought this Jesus thing was all nonsense, but maybe there's some truth to it. And for Ananias here, for his part, he sees that God wants him to go talk to Saul, but he thinks, Lord, you must be confused. This guy is like Stalin. Why would I go visit him? That sounds dangerous. This sounds crazy. We should have a different plan. And yet we see God's actually at work in this. Um, and God even foreshadows a lot of what will happen with Saul. He says, I, it's my purpose to use him. He, he doesn't, he, he'll soon find out what kind of suffering he's going to do for my kingdom. The price he'll pay for the persecution in effect. All right. So, uh, let's continue on. Actually, we didn't discuss the whole thing, did we? Yeah. I'm sorry, I this morning. Um, yeah. Did we, did we have, have we read 10 through 19? Yes, we did. Okay, so we didn't finish discussing it. Um, so Saul goes in, Ananias goes in, lays his hands on Saul and heals him. Um, and immediately the, the blindness that he's experiencing passes away, the scales fall from his eyes, and he's healed from what's going on, uh, and he goes immediately and is baptized. So he immediately converts to Christianity in response to what he sees. And we can see a firm conviction uh, through that in, in what that Saul realizes the error of his ways and goes from there. Um, okay, let's pick up at verses 20 through 25 now. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on the name? And as he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they could blow a close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. We can see in a sense the, how heartfelt Saul's conversion is here. Because... He immediately not only believes and is baptized, but he actually starts going and sharing the word with others. And as other Jewish believers begin to watch this, they seem to be just as mystified and just as confused by the situation as Ananias was. They think, wait a minute, Saul? He was supposed to be coming here to arrest Christians. What is he doing preaching about Jesus? He's now preaching on behalf of the very person that he was arresting anybody who preached on behalf of. And so there's a huge irony that happens here. And the local Jewish people watching this are initially confused, but as Saul comes in and begins using God's word, and, and we can imagine uh, with his vast knowledge, looking at the Old Testament, ref referring to all of these different passages about the Messiah, over 350 prophecies in the Old Testament relate to who Jesus was, and Saul is an expert on the subject. Um, now he can use this knowledge that God has built him up to have to argue for Jesus. He goes in and begins soundly debating and soundly winning these debates with believers. Now, it sounds like Saul is actually in Damascus for several months. In the book of Galatians, we hear not only is Saul actually going out and preaching in Damascus itself, but he's ranging out into the area surrounding it. So for several months, he is effectively a traveling evangelist in the area, preaching uh, to anyone that will hear him and growing the church through it. And so, in effect, he's doing the exact opposite of what he came to Damascus to do. Rather than arresting Christians and hauling them off and diminishing the church, He's actually growing it. He's sharing uh, knowledge and wisdom of who Jesus is. 
this grows to a point where the local people in, in Damascus, particularly the Jewish people who are frustrated that they can't win an argument against him, begin to think, I have a solution. And uh, again, in Galatians, we actually see it's not just them, but they've actually gone and gotten the ear of the local king who rules that area. They're in a different region than Judea, so it's a different king that rules over Damascus. But they convince that king to go ahead and send out his guards to watch the gateways and to arrest him. First chance they get when he goes out to go share the gospel with somebody else outside of the city of Damascus itself, their clients will arrest him and will execute him. We can solve this problem really quickly. No more preaching Saul uh, around us here. And uh, in response to that, early Christians actually gather around Saul. They protect him. Uh, they take him and lower him out of a, a gap in the wall, probably some sort of porthole meant to be shot out of or something like that. And they lower him down to safety to where he can flee. And from there, uh, he's going to make his way to Jerusalem. And so, uh, Saul escapes with his life, but it's interesting to see the contrast. Because Saul becomes go, contrasts from becoming the person who brings persecution to suddenly becoming the object of persecution for actually preaching the same message that he was condemning others for. Things that have really come full circle. And I think everybody is really, it's clear, everybody is really thrown off that God is making things work together this way. It's not something that, that is expected at all. All right, uh, verses 26 through 31. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how, on his journey, he had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus, he had pre fear preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, and they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit. It increased in numbers. So the book of Thessalonians actually gives some record of this same time period. But Saul makes a journey to Jerusalem, back to this area that was his home base where he had so heavily persecuted the church. And when he gets there, he wants to go talk to the apostles, to the church leadership. His goal is is to go make an inroads there, maybe even learn some underneath them. But their response is somewhat understandable in context. They say, this guy has killed a whole lot of us. There's no way we're going to trust him, and there's no way we're going to let him come and find us. Now, this was a season of persecution, so uh, it's not as if the apostles all would have been in a uniform building just staying put and waiting where you could easily find them. So this is probably one of those situations where you don't actually find them unless you have an invitation to do it. You need to have the right connections and have somebody lead you into that. But Barnabas, a uh, deacon and leader in the early church, goes out, and his name is, means son of encouragement. This seems to be something he lives up to regularly. We'll see throughout uh, the accounts about him. Barnabas goes and decides to give it a chance. He goes and has a conversation with Saul, begins to learn about what happened on Damascus. Here's the accounts of what had happened up there. Probably Barnabas has already heard some other believers talk about, have you guys heard what happened? This guy who was trying to kill us is now preaching the gospel. It's crazy. Um, but he then takes Saul to the apostles, they hear what he has to say, and they go ahead and, and uh, in effect, give their blessing to him being in the area. In Thessalonians, it notes, though, that while he's there, he is not regularly in the audience of the apostles. He'll spend some time being discipled by Peter himself. Um, he'll meet James for a brief period of time, the brother of Jesus. But by and large, he's not spending every day in the presence of the apostles. He's actually going out and continuing to evangelize. He's continuing his evangelism career. In fact, in Thessalonians, he notes that a lot of the church, local churches, even, still wouldn't let him come in because they were really nervous about him. Whatever other people might say, they knew what this guy had done. And it's intriguing to note here, as we look at this, again, we have this group of people who followed Jesus firsthand for three years. The apostles. People who seem to really be in the know, by and large. And yet, God has done this thing with Saul. And they don't even realize the full extent of it yet. But all of them say, this can't be. This doesn't make any sense. How could God 
used him. That guy's horrible. There's no way God would use him for his kingdom. They have this, this preset bias against this, and they can see, in a sense, what God's doing, and yet they, they don't want to believe it. And the early Christians, the same way, the churches, who wouldn't let him in. It was the same sentiment. No, God wouldn't do that. That guy's horrible. It couldn't be. And there's this constant tension that we see throughout this chapter where all of the believers seem to think they have some notion of what God is doing, and yet God is actually doing something quite different. And there's that... Um, that disconnect between expectations and reality. All right. So let's go ahead and continue on with verses 32 through 35. Uh, and you know what? I'm sorry. I should mention at the end of that passage, they said that uh, persecution actually began to die off in Jerusalem and in Judea at that time. So there was a, a a couple year period where the persecution let up some. The church grew in response to that. They were able to preach the gospel more. Um, it doesn't give an exact reason other than that season that came about. So now we're going to begin reading the last two sections, which are going to be about Peter and his ministry. So there's, there's relevant stuff that happens here, but it doesn't relate back uh, as directly uh, to, to our main passage on the conversion of Saul himself. So we'll now do verses 32 through 35. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Bible. There he found a man named Danius, who was paralyzed and had, bed, had been bedridden for eight years. Danius, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Danius got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So we see Peter begins traveling. He's traveling out towards the Mediterranean coast, again on an evangelistic mission. When he gets there, he finds a guy who's been paralyzed since his birth. He heals him, and people in mass start converting in that area, to begin understanding who Jesus is, see the miracles that happen, and take that as an evidence of who Jesus is. And we're going to see another miracle that happens here in, in verses 36 through 43. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In, her, in Greek, her name was Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. Her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Uh, Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and argued him. Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with him. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. And he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Okay, so in these final accounts of Peter, we see first he heals this, this paralyzed man and tells him to pick up his mat and go. That miracle spreads the gospel. Afterwards, a city that's about one day's travel away has a woman who named Lydia who dies. Now, Lydia, or Dorcas, as it, as it is in the Greek, her name actually means gazelle, for what it's worth. Um, and both of those words in their respective languages mean the same thing. And she apparently is a very generous woman in the early church. And in the ancient world, Widows, particularly widows who didn't have any family to support them, were some of the most susceptible people uh, to, to suffering that existed. They didn't have any sort of social security or protection that way. And so it was very easy for those women to, who, who may not have resources to fall victim to others. In this case, we see that this woman had a huge ministry to these widows, that many of them are there and they're around her and mourning her loss. Uh, and, and Peter, interesting to note as we, as we talk about this, 
if where Peter was was a day's travel away, that means it took a day for men to come and get him and a day for them to travel back. According to the Jewish law, you're actually supposed to bury somebody the first day that they've died. In this case, it seems that perhaps they've held off on that in the hopes that Peter can come there, probably thinking that Peter's going to officiate the funeral, that he's going to be part of the funeral service and join them in mourning for this very influential believer in this early church. But when Peter shows up, the plan doesn't quite go that way. He goes upstairs, and he finds Lydia's body laying there, and there's a group of mourning widows around, and each of them are saying to him, look at this, this clothing. She made this for me. She's provided for so many of my basic needs. This is such a great person. And Peter asks them to leave the room, begins to pray for Lydia, and he tells her to get up. After two days of being dead, he commands her to arise and get up, and this woman is healed. She's resurrected. And again here, we see this as a way that God is showing his power and how it's manifest in the church. If you've got any question about whether Jesus can raise himself from the grave, this would sure be a good sign to kind of see what God is actually capable of. And so Peter raises her from the dead. The local people celebrate. And it's really hard for a skeptic to say anything about this other than God must be behind this. Because people don't just casually raise other people from the dead. It's not a common occurrence, as you might have noticed. Uh, and yet, Peter does this miracle. And so we see the church grows even more there in this whole region. Uh, it, it continues to expand. So as we look at this passage, one of the main things I want to zoom in on with the conversion of Saul, you know, I, I think there's two big things we can actually take away from this. One is that Saul was a really bad guy, right? He went around and arrested and killed Christians. And it's pretty fascinating to see that God's grace can extend beyond that. So it's good to know on a personal level, if you're not sure about things you've done in your past, or if you feel at times like, boy, Pastor, if I told you all the horrible things I've done in my life, you'd realize pretty quickly, God can't help me. Well, you'd be wrong. If, if God can use somebody like Saul and can turn his life around to serve his kingdom, then God can meet you and show you the same grace. You don't know what he's calling you to yet, so you might find that exciting as, as Saul did. But, <laughs> but um, nonetheless, God's grace is definitely that big. But the, the bigger theme I want to show here is that it's really fascinating to know that there are a whole lot of people who are followers of Jesus in our passage, and virtually none of them actually seem to understand what God is doing. It's a little bit mystifying. I mean, Saul himself professes to be a follower of God, and yet he doesn't seem to understand who the Messiah is, even when the Messiah is living right amongst him. It finally takes this, this miraculous vision that Saul has before he realizes who Jesus is. His expectations are divine. But it's not just him. All the believers in Damascus, all the disciples themselves in Jerusalem, the churches in Jerusalem, one person after another is constantly in this position of thinking that they know how God would work and finding out it's not exactly what they thought. And I, I think that oftentimes in our own spiritual walks, we kind of believe this way too. Now, obviously, you know, when God does something, he's going to do something in keeping with his, with his word. So if somebody comes and tells you that, you know, God told me I should go murder my neighbor. Okay, well, probably we can safely say here, no. No, God wouldn't tell you that because that's in defiance of what God's word says. It's against his character. But in this case, it's not a scriptural imperative or a moral imperative we're seeing. We're just seeing that God often can take the most improbable people and do giant things with them. That is incredible. I, I look at people like Robbie Zacharias, who's probably one of the best Christian apologists of our area, the era, if you guys haven't seen any of his videos, you can look it up on YouTube, but um, he, he was some average kid from India who came to Jesus Christ and is now one of the most powerful advocates of Christianity the world around. He's got travels the world, Cambridge, Yale, Harvard, schools like this call him in to debate them about who the Christ is, and he has an incredible testimony. And yet, you wouldn't think this average guy from India would be the one who would do that. But for God, and his accounting, he can use whoever he wants. He can take somebody from an impoverished country and raise them up to a position of prominence in his kingdom. He can do whatever he wants. And oftentimes we get this idea in our mind of the way God's going to do things, and we're not really open to the way that God's working. And so there's an encouragement here in our own lives to be watching how God is actually at work, to be watching where he's bearing fruit, 
and to be open to the things he's doing. And sometimes he doesn't do things the way we expect, and we end up missing out on part of it because of this. In this, this passage, really, Barnabas is the only one who seems to really be open to the idea that God would use somebody like Saul for the purpose he is. And we're just beginning to see it. Saul's only been preaching for a few years now, but God in the long run, we'll see, is actually going to take this guy who was once the key persecutor of the church and use him to convert more people to Christianity than perhaps anybody else in the early church. I mean, he's going to be right up there with somebody like Peter in terms of the amount of the ancient world that actually comes to know Jesus because of him. All right, at this time I'm going to ask uh, one of our leaders to come forward and to lead us in our meditations as they do I'll ask you to join. We often get a conception of the way we think that you should do things. When we put our expectations in place for you and wait for you to fulfill them. But we can see in our passage today, Lord, that sometimes, especially to demonstrate your glory, you'll take the most improbable people and use them in the most spectacular ways. Lord, it might be somebody sitting here today as one of those improbable people who nobody ever would have thought would come to you and yet they have. And Lord, it could very well be that there's somebody here today who you want to use in a powerful way to change the face of Christianity. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to have open hearts to that. That you would help us to see who we are in light of your power and those around us as well. We may not think the wonderful things would, would be done so boldly with.